So here are the five elements. So I, so I think it's helpful to simplify this definition a bit to, to, to sort of distill what are some of the main points of the definition. So I've tried to do that. And this is using um, some, some guidelines from the North American Association of Environmental Education. What they have done is extracted these six principles. So if you had to say, what are the six most important parts of, of EE? What are the six most important ideas that comprise environmental education? They would be these, these ones that I had in green now listed here um, in these circles. And part of what I'm trying to denote with this image is that these all Im impact one another. So these are, it's a, these all feed into one another and they're not discrete entities. I think that, that makes a lot of sense when you start thinking about it. But just a few more thoughts about each of these points, each of these components of environmental education. So process gets at this idea, that point about facilitating, this idea that it's, it's an ongoing dynamic process. I also like to think about it with the terms lifelong and life-wide. So lifelong is a term we hear more often. This means that environmental education happens throughout the life course. We most often talk about it with children, but in the environmental education field, it's discussed as a process that is ongoing. It happens throughout the life phases and years. we're constantly learning about the environment and about our, how our actions impact the environment. And then this concept of life-wide is, is a newer term that I, is not used very often, but I really like it because lifelong is it happens from when you're young to when you're old. And life-wide is it happens all over your life, all across your life. So it really infuses all aspects of your life and is not isolated to, for instance, one piece of your life, one piece of your life, maybe if you're a farmer or a herder, this idea that environmental education is only related to one thing that you do. Uh, the idea of life-wide is it's related to everything that we do, all of the choices that we make throughout our life, both in terms of throughout our life course time-wise and throughout our life course in terms of on a given day, everything we do can be related to environmental ed. Knowledge, you can think about this in terms of not and the intertwining of social and economic issues. So this is that's a really big focus in environmental education is to look at the, the comprehensive whole of social and environmental social economic and environmental issues that are that are integrated. So not just environment, but social economic and environment. And then a really big focus is also the way that the environment and the state of the environment impacts quality of life. So this idea of integrating social and ecological, that idea of understanding, <clears throat> understanding how we're connected and how our well-being is connected to that of the environment is one of the ways to, one of the foci of the knowledge piece of environmental ed. In terms of awareness, this can be thought of in a couple of ways. <clears throat> one of the aspects of awareness is recognition of environmental threats. So becoming aware of the, the dangers and the threats and the problems we have with the environment. That's one thing. And then the other one, this came up in the comments that you all made, understanding the impacts of our actions. So this at times, and particularly with issues like climate change, where the impacts of an action are very dispersed and very long-term, it's, it's not obviously connected. So the, the impact of our action is not obviously connected to something observable that a lot of environmental education is making those links, making those links that may not be immediately obvious. And even sometimes when they are obvious, people don't think about them. So understanding the impacts of our actions. And then the last three, were, there was a little bit less about this in your responses, so we can spend a little more time on these as we go through the day. But skills is the idea of, it, you're not just giving people information, that you're giving people ways to move forward and specific tools, practices, skills that help people take action and, and do something with the information that they have. So two ways of thinking about this is that this work empowers people. So it's not just giving people information, not just giving students information, but it's giving them the sense that they have the ability to take action, that they can be engaged and active citizens. So this feeling of empowerment is part of skill building. And then really importantly, thinking specifically about tools, practices, what are you doing to give people, to give your students particular <clears throat> uh, sets of, of abilities to, that they can use moving forward. 
attitudes. This is one that's very close to my heart. It's very close to what I study and work on. <clears throat> and this is a big word <clears throat> that incorporates a lot of different things. So it includes thoughts, feelings. Some say that it includes, or it's, it's closely related to values, which was mentioned. So this is the, the psychological mental processes that are going on when we do environmental education. And part of the reason these are so important is that they're often seen to underlie behavior. So these are sort of the, the precursor psychologically to people taking action. So the important thing here is as we move down the chain, we're not just in environmental education conveying knowledge. It's not just about sharing knowledge and awareness. This is what's happening, but it's about instilling some degree of concern and care getting to that emotional level where there's, there's an attitude that changes that people's thoughts and feelings potentially values are changing and are, are moving towards a more sort of pro-sustainability uh, orientation. And we'll talk more about what that might mean in a few minutes. And then the last one. So all definitions of environmental education that I know of end in action. That the, the point of environmental education, again, I will say this many, many times, is not just delivery of information. It's not just you want people to be able to repeat information. It's that you want them to know that they can do something and then to do something. So the idea of environmental education and it, and it, it motivates people to do something. And then importantly, that, that action can look lots of ways. So, so part of the discussion of environmental education is that the, the realm and range of things that we need to do to address environmental issues is very wide, very large. And so people can take action in many, many ways. Okay, I will stop for a moment. Does any, if you have any questions, this is always true. If you have questions, you can raise your hand, ask them in the chat, but I'll just stop for a second if, in case any of this is unclear or you have follow-ups. Okay, if not, I'm just plug in my computer, which was about to die, which would have been very bad. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so another important point here. So these are the, the points that um, arise from the Tbilisi Declaration. So this almost 50 year old kind of founding definition of environmental education. There are a few other points that are discussed in the environmental education literature and, and especially that have come up more recently that I'd like to highlight two main points here. The first is the importance of place. So this is something that, that has really developed in the past 50 years, this idea of the sort of act global, act local, think global model, or this idea of nesting a place within a hierarchy of other places and understanding the relationship between our individual place where we live and the larger geographical and ecological systems in which it is embedded. So that's what this uh, image indicates that the way people often think about their place is that you have your home, you have your, your, your neighborhood, then a little bit larger community. Interesting to think about your watershed. So that might not be in, in, in many people's conceptions when they think about organizing space, they might not initially think of a watershed, but that's a way, that's a sort of environmentally literate way of thinking about your place is sort of these social indicators, neighborhood community, and then an, an, a biogeographical indicator, an ecological indicator based on a watershed is the, the, uh, the area that drains into a certain river. So they can be many different sizes, but understanding where is the area that drains into a particular uh, water source. So you could say the watershed of a lake, for instance, the watershed of an estuary, something like that. Um, and then state, bioregion, nation, and then global. So this idea of both really connecting to a specific place, but constantly making links between that particular place and global issues. So one way of thinking about this is that environmental education sees place as the context for learning, the context for application, and the context of transfer. So that it's often referred to, or another very closely related field, to environmental education is place-based education. This idea that really, really becoming grounded in place is a really important component of environmental education. So again, place, as it's written here, place is the context for learning application and transfer, meaning place is the, the central fulcrum around which all of this learning takes place, that, that all of this 
learning is happening in a real physical place. And when we look at some of the activities that we have prepared that you could potentially use with students, you'll see that all of the activities really focus in one way or another. They, they help students become aware of their places, to learn about their places, to become connected to their places emotionally. So that idea of, of, of a place being really important is very central to most environmental education. So that's the place is the context. But then again, the reason I use this image is that constantly linking that particular place to larger realms of space, to larger um, areas. Okay. <laughs> Just, you know, reading your comment. It's much harder than you thought. Yes. It's hard to even get your family to act on the environment. Absolutely. So I mean, this is really important. It's a, it's a very big goal, very big goal. Um, and, and it is hard. The behavior change piece is hard. So I appreciate that comment. And we will, we will talk about uh, how you might sort of start chipping away at that large, difficult <laughs> task. And actually, the next slide, I think, is one way of doing that. So this is something, again, that I focus on because it's particularly close to my own research, my own personal work and experience. A lot of my empirical work uh, demonstrates the importance of that emotional piece. And, and I think it's interesting that in the Tbilisi Declaration, there isn't that much. So if we go back briefly to the Tbilisi Declaration, there isn't as much about as emotion. Attitudes sort of include emotion, but it wasn't a really big focus in the 70s in this international body. But research in, in the ensuing decades has shown that, that emotion and particularly thing, uh, emotions or, or sentiments like wonder can be really important. So this is another way, so it's a very similar diagram to the last, a lot of, a lot of nesting. Um, but the idea here is that one of the things we want to do in environmental education is inspire wonder. <laughs> and that is this idea of being impressed and, and, and um, let's see, how, would I, how else could you say wonder? Um, amazed and sort of fascinated. So all of those words are similar to wonder. Impressed, amazed, fascinated by the natural world. And that idea of just being sort of intrigued and fascinated by the natural world is, is one of the things that we're really trying to, to start with. And that, that that is a sort of seed, as you can see in this image, it's the seed for a lot of the other things that we're, we're aiming for in environmental education. So I really like this diagram. There's a, there's a lot that you can unpack here, sort of. So this idea of wonder, <clears throat> and I'll <clears throat> go ahead and, and put this up. So EE prioritizes wonder. So environmental education prioritizes wonder, which is related to awe, sort of amazement, and also related to inquiry. And the idea of wonder and awe and inquiry is that these ultimately lead to action. So this is another way of thinking about how we get to action. So I think Justine's point that this is hard, it's really complex and hard. This is a way to sort of get to the I would say that the human core of why people might care about this and why they might be inspired to learn more about the environment, to gain the skills, and to possibly take action. I'm just going to look really quickly at the chat. Yes, easiest place to start EE is definitely home and family. I think very true with people who you know. You can, you can try these things out with your home and family. Yeah, thanks, Zemi. And yeah, exactly. So to encourage action. Yep. So that's what we're talking about is that, that potentially this is a way to get past the, the, the complexity or not get past, but to, to, to break into the complexity um, that we're talking about when we talk about environmental education. So a little bit more about this. So wonder is this, is this idea of being, being fascinated and intrigued by what you see in the natural world. And that fascination and intrigue relate to inquiry. So this idea that when you start to wonder about something, you say, oh my gosh, this caterpillar is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And it's bright green and it has little red dots on it and it has little antennae and they're, they're moving around. And I'm just going to be really focused on and mindful of what's going on with this caterpillar. And when I really look at it, it's really amazing. Or if I think about what's going to happen to this caterpillar in a few weeks, it's going to make a little house around itself and sit there for a few more weeks. And then suddenly it's going to become a butterfly. Whoa. That's amazing. So if you just sort of break down the, the beauty and the wonder, 
the, the beauty and the, the processes, it, it's, it's pretty easy to start to, to instill that sense of wonder. And it's, it's super related, very related to this idea of inquiry. So you start to say, okay, well, how does that work? How does this caterpillar, what does it do? What happens for those few weeks when it's in its cocoon and it's changing from being this caterpillar into being this butterfly with, with wings that have colors on them and they're made out of a different material? What is happening? Like, this, is, this is crazy. It, it encourages you to want to learn. And then that second piece there of making connections, it encourages you to want to figure out what else is going on here? What, what does this caterpillar eat? What eats this caterpillar? What might be endangering this caterpillar? What might be making its life more difficult? So connecting this thing that you're looking at to other aspects of the world to think about both the social and ecological phenomena that are connected to this thing that might be inspiring wonder. When you start to learn about it, so the next circle out, you start to learn about it. Oh, okay. So I'm learning perhaps, <coughs> perhaps that um, climate change is impacting the plant that this caterpillar eats, maybe. And so I've learned that, okay, that helps me understand climate change in a way I didn't before. It helps me understand that climate change has an impact right here, right now on this thing that I'm holding in my hand or looking at on this plant. And then that moving into the purple part of this diagram, that deeper understanding would lead to this sense of responsibility. Oh, well, I, I, I want, I feel like I need to do something about this. I feel responsible that I need to take, to, to do something about this. I care about it to the next circle. That idea, that feeling of responsibility leading to a sense of care, concern, and then ultimately that that care and concern would lead to action, to doing something to, to mitigate whatever it is that you're looking at. <clears throat> so that second arrow, the efficacy and civic engagement, grow from what's 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 depicted in this image is that the, the efficacy and civic engagement grow from that core of understanding and knowledge. But again, the new thing I'm adding here to the Tbilisi Declaration is that 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 nugget in the middle of wonder. And that sort of brings up, I don't know, a beauty and a and an emotional tingling to that idea of understanding and knowledge. It's not just knowledge, but inspiring that emotional side of knowledge that really encourages um, the, the deeper, deeper inquiry and encourages people to move into those levels of responsibility and caring and action. Okay. So a couple other big things I want to mention that, that are again, emerging trends or just things that people are discussing quite a bit. And Justine, I would love to move into breakouts in a few minutes. So if you could start preparing the breakouts, it'll be maybe three or five minutes, as you said. <clears throat> So that was my reminder to that. <laughs> so importantly, one thing that's really discussed a lot in environmental education is, is it is not an add-on. Ideally, it's not an add-on. It's not one piece of the curriculum where there's, you know, um, one occasionally uh, environmental education comes in and there's one environmental education unit. Ideally, and I realize this is not possible and we can actually talk about this, but it would be integrated throughout the curriculum. So ideally there would be environmental bits of information and activities, wonder, inspiration, being, being interspersed into the curriculum in little bits. And so that's, and again, that may not be possible with the kind of programs you all are running, but I think it's important to know that if that's something you can discuss, maybe it's that when you meet with teachers, you discuss this, you could start to think about, okay, how could we, bring in little bits of environmental education into other things that you're doing. The idea here is that it's not this, in, in students' minds, it's not this isolated activity that is that only happens at certain times. So this gets at the life-wide point of process, like that, that environmental education is not this isolated unit, that it's a process that happens all over the place and it's relevant to all subjects and everything that we're doing. So and, and, and <clears throat> that shouldn't be overwhelming. It could be overwhelming, but instead you can see it as, this is just a very, it's a big idea. It's a big idea that infuses who we are as humans, how we relate to the rest of the world, how we exist in the world. And so you can bring in these ideas in lots of different topics. And secondly, <clears throat> that one overarching concept in environmental education that differs from a lot of other education is there's a shift in focus from humans being the only or the most important consideration. So this idea that, that much education implicitly assumes that our attention should be focused completely on humans. And environmental education shifts that. 
And it says, we have to be thinking about interactions. We have to be thinking about, we don't exist, humans do not exist in isolation. We cannot exist in isolation. We have to exist in integration with the rest of the world. And so that means we have to consider and we have to give importance to the rest of the world. That's why I started with that image of all different entities. <laughs> so, and humans being sort of in the mix with a lot of other creatures, large and small. That's a really important part of environmental education to think of ourselves as part of this, this universe of beings um, and, and to help students understand that situatedness. Great, and I'm looking at, at Vina from Nature Conservation. I love your point to add love. So just, I'm gonna go back to that adding love to sense of wonder. Absolutely, I think love is really connected. It's, it's wonder, maybe caring, love and caring. So it could be in that maybe caring circle as well. Um, or maybe it's both. If you start with the wonder and the love and then the, the love is connected to the caring, totally agree. And that's something, I actually have one of my PhD students who is an environmental educator. She's doing her PhD as she works with many environmental educators here in Vermont. She trains environmental educators and her, the focus of her PhD is love, specifically because she feels with all of the work she does with environmental education and environmental education, educators, that it's such an important concept. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about what you think of that perhaps, um, because she, with all of her experience, that is her focus, that that is a really important concept. So thank you for that, that addition. It's, that's really important. Maybe I'll add a little heart to the middle of that diagram. That might work very well. Okay. Um, so these are a couple other points I wanted to make about environmental education. So now I want to shift a little bit, and I'm going to talk about a, a related field, very, very closely related to environmental education, and that is education for sustainability. So there's a lot of discussion in the field about what exactly we call this and it, how is education for sustainability different than environmental education. I'm not going to get into all of those things because to me, I, I kind of bring in concepts from education for sustainability and from environmental education. They're very, they're very intertwined and connected. So education for sustainability, a slightly different angle on environmental education, <clears throat> this idea of integrating really, really integrating at a, as a very focal level social issues is the way some people describe this, but environmental educators, people who call themselves environmental educators also integrate social issues hugely. So again, the differences I don't think are substantial. I think they're different names for basically the same thing. This is my take. Um, and so there's one <clears throat> way of thinking about education for sustainability that I find helpful and that I thought would be helpful as, a, as the seed for a discussion. So it's this diagram that, that I think has a lot, there's a lot in this diagram that can be helpful to think about, to reflect on, and to inspire what you might do in an environmental education program. So here on the left, I've written that you can think of these big ideas of sustainability as concepts that environmental education seeks to teach or to consider. So a number of these have already come up in the conversation, but to me, this diagram helps put them all in one place and then adds a number of other ideas that are central to sustainability thinking that we haven't talked about yet. So as you can see, and this was produced by Shelburne Farms, the Sustainable Schools Project of Shelburne Farms. This is actually where that student I mentioned who's focusing on love, she works there. So she was involved in creating this. She works at Shelburne Farms, which is a big, environmental education provider here in the Northeastern United States. And then the Children's Environment or Environmental Literacy Foundation. So this diagram is designed for educators. It's designed by educators for educators to talk about environmental education or education for sustainability. So the basic idea of this diagram <clears throat> is that it's a flower and that the petals of the flower, the blossom, are the three components of sustainability that you've probably all heard of. So environment, social, and economic. So the end of the flower is we're going for environmental integrity, social equity, and economic vitality. And then the, the leaves of the flower, so the things that, that sustain the flower, that, that allow it to live, the photosynthesis part, are all of the different big ideas or concepts that are really important in sustainability, education for sustainability, or environmental education. So what I'd like to do, instead of talking through all of these, I think the, they're pretty straight, they're pretty self-explanatory, especially with the little definitions that you have. 
I hope this is big enough to read. Hopefully you can, I'm gonna give you um, somewhere you can go to look at it during the breakout. But what I'd like to do is give you some time to chew on this in breakout groups. So to really talk about it. So here are the questions I'd like for you to address in the breakout discussions. The first is of the of first question for you is which of these ideas seem most relevant in your context? So just thinking through them and talking about are any of them more, do they jump out at you more as this one is really important? And, and then are there any that seem less important? Any that seem least less relevant in your context? So these ones you might de-emphasize. So talking about those, you might really want to emphasize some, de-emphasize others. And then the third question, I'd love for you to talk about which will be most difficult to teach. So if we're thinking about, you're thinking about designing programs that hit on, that address all of these different concepts, which are going to be the trickiest? And then maybe we can discuss if we may come back in, if, if you've a number of groups, if you've identified one's concepts that you think are going to be complicated, we can discuss them. We can, we can figure out how you might address some of these challenges. And then I'd like you to think about what is missing here. So is there anything that you think should be a big idea of sustainability that you're not seeing represented in this diagram? Okay, so what I have done is I have created a Jamboard, which if you haven't used, is a, it's a Google product that's a pretty simple sort of uh, open, open document where you can easily add comments. And so that's the way I'm thinking. If you all, you can go into your breakout groups, you can have one person who's a scribe, for instance, so one person taking notes, or you can all take notes. But if you could just put up a few things, don't have to be super detailed because we'll have all the groups using the same Jamboard. So you'll be able to see what everybody else is writing at the same time. But the idea is to get some of your thoughts down and then we'll come back to the main group and we'll go through them and, and, and discuss a little bit in the big group. I'll maybe comment on some of the things that you've shared and we'll have a little bit of a discussion. So just there are there are five images on the Jamboard. So just to show you um, that, so this you're gonna have this slide is the first thing on the Jamboard. So you'll have these questions, you'll have this image of the big ideas of sustainability. That's the first image on the Jamboard. And then there are some little arrows up top. There's some little kind of triangles that go like this. You just click those and you'll be able to go to the next pages. And then I've put these questions on each of the next four pages. So the idea here is that you'll be able to see this on the first page of the Jamboard once you're in your breakouts. And then on the next four pages, there's just open pages where you can add little text boxes that you can share what you're talking about in your group. And I think we'll probably do about maybe 12 to 13 minutes. I think we can, we can let you know as we're getting close to that time, but why don't you plan on having at least 13 minutes in your breakout so that you can introduce yourselves. And then there's four questions. So that's, you know, a couple minutes per question. And anything else that we should say before we go into breakouts? I'm going to put the Jamboard into the chat right now. So that's the Jamboard. And it, I think we tested it. So you should be able to use it, access it, et cetera. But any questions or anything before we go into breakouts? I think, Rochelle, just to quickly add, uh, if we want to add to the uh, Jamboard, there, the, there's the T text box button on the left-hand side, right at the bottom. So we yes. can use that. Yeah, perfect. So there's a couple different ways to add things. It's, it's neatest when there's a lot of people. Um, there's a little box that has a T. If you use that one, and then you can change the size and the color and stuff and move it around. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think then... Justine, we're ready to go into breakouts. So I will be in one breakout. I'm really excited to meet some of you and we'll come back here in maybe 13, 14 minutes, something like that. Awesome, well, I saw some wonderful things being put onto the Jamboard. So thank you so much about for all these comments. So I wanted to quickly ask before, I, I was gonna spend some time talking through the Jamboard and, and asking if you wanted to bring up any of the maybe that came up in the discussion sections, but. Um, organizers, Ranjani, Justine, should we take a quick break? Would, was that a good idea or do you normally not take breaks? What makes sense? I think it's really up to you and the group. It's, um, if it's two hours within, I, sometimes people are okay to go through. If it's two an hour and a half, some people like breaks, but I think up to you guys, yeah. Okay. Anyone, does anyone have an opinion one way or the other? I just want to leave space for that. If people are like, I just need a, you know, three minute bio break, whatever. Nope. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, I I have to say something uh, like uh, we know we know as our facilitator we had a really good conversation, but we didn't know how to use the jam board. I was uh, like, this is the first time that we are using, and uh, yeah. the, the 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 topic that we had more discussed was on the what part what what are missing on the template. So we all agreed that the root is missing because there are stems, leaves, and flowers, but uh, oh. we, we thought that the roots are missing. So uh, we concluded that the, play, uh, the, the people that we are targeting and the place that we are where we need to target and the educator approach that should be in the, in the root, that, that, that what we uh, like concluded. Okay, I see that. So someone did get that in there, actually. There, someone managed to get Yeah, it. it was me. It was in the last minute <laughs> that I just- Oh, great, okay. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, so so I'm so sorry that the jamboard. I was worried about that. It, it it's a new thing and it confuses everyone. <laughs> so don't feel bad. It, it confuses my students too. So um, my, you know, when I'm in college and everything. So it, yeah, it's confusing. I'm sorry about that. I I um, but it looks like at least some people got some things in there. So sorry about the confusing interface. Um, and I know someone in in my group also couldn't couldn't open it. So. Yeah, sorry about that, but I think we got some of the thoughts. And what, what I'd love to do is we can have a discussion right now. And then if anything came up in your conversation that's not in the Jamboard, then we'll just talk about it. Um, great, so what I might do is share my screen so that we can all be looking and you don't have to be switching between windows or anything. So I'll share my screen and you can see the, the Jamboard if that sounds good. Let me just do that. Okay, I think that should be good. You're seeing the Jamboard now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. <clears throat> okay. So a few, so the, the, of the four questions I asked, it seemed like there was a lot of discussion on what is missing, which is, which is great. Really interesting. Um, so we'll quickly go through these ones that are relevant and not relevant. Um, so we had ideas of community, place, equilibrium, and ability to make a difference as being most relevant. I think was, this could have been hard in that you might think that all of these are relevant. <laughs> these are all um, important and relevant. So I, I, I don't know, was this difficult for people to do or was this pretty obvious? Let me look at the chat. I think it was not difficult. It just depends on priorities. I mean, on the steps that you take usually when you do partnership building or intervention. So first you go to community, you talk. So the relevance depends on the on your actions. Great. Okay. Thank you, Ulubek. Yeah, that's um, the relevance depends on what you're doing, right? And they're 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 relevant at different times, maybe, um, yeah. at different points of a process. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. So, um, so I think so. Hopefully, it was helpful. Part of the idea of that question was just to give you a chance to look at these and think about them and think about applying them. So. That idea that they're relevant in different contexts also, I think that depending on the nature of your program and, and what you're trying to do with it, they're gonna be relevant in different ways. Okay, I will move along. Least relevant, <laughs> yeah, okay. So similar point that these are, they're all relevant based on the local system, what um, what you choose. I think that what Luke Beck was just saying is that it's, it depends what, which ones you're gonna highlight, but they're all relevant. All right. Most difficult to teach. So this is maybe where we, we could start storming. Okay, if they're difficult to teach, what, we, what might we do about that? So what do we have? We had long-term and change over time. We had two change. So two, two voting for change, um, an ability to make a difference because most people and children feel like they can't make a difference. They think they're just children. How can we make a difference? What we do doesn't matter, et cetera. Yep. Um, and then the last one, everything is interconnected. Yep. Which, which is one of the, so interdependence maybe, is that saying that interdependence is difficult, very difficult to explain, links to ability to make a difference. Okay, interesting. So we basically have, in many ways, ability to make a difference is in the two middle ones, both address the ability to make a difference, and then the two on the sides, both address change over time. So that's interesting. So a lot of groups came, came together <laughs> with those points. Um, totally agree. So the, the change over time piece, um, both of these kind of comments, it's really hard to see that because we because we can't see it in many cases. And one of my favorite um, books that I read years ago when I was doing my PhD was about 
it was, it was a very like evolutionary approach to human behavior. And it made this point that we are not, we have not evolved to detect the changes that are happening in the environment. So we, we, we did not, we evolved to respond to threats that are um, a, 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 a snake in front of us, right? Or, or some sort of animal that might hurt us. We're, we've evolved to react and run, et cetera, from, from threats that are like, that look like that, that are perceived at that level. We did not evolve to perceive threats like climate change. We don't have the, the senses <laughs> to understand carbon dioxide levels, to, to detect changes in temperature that are that slow. Like we just, we don't, we can't do it without special instruments. And so the, the, the way we, we respond is so different because we can't detect that change easily. So I think that's a, that's a really important point that how do we demonstrate this change? How do we make this point about change? Um, another idea that, that is potentially help, helpful here, just throwing out some ideas related to this idea of change. Um, there is a concept called shifting baselines. I don't know if you've heard of this idea of shifting baselines, but a baseline is where you're starting, right? It's sort of the starting point um, and an understanding of, for instance, a level of pollution or a level of forest in an area, the, the amount of forest in an area would be like a baseline is where you're starting. And the idea of shifting baselines is that as the environment changes, ensuing generations, they start with an expectation that's different. So the baseline that that expectation of what is a normal level of forest, for instance, changes with different generations. And so if someone is, you know, born and raised in a place with a lot of forest, their baseline is that lot of forest. But then 40 years later, the next generation or two generations later is is raised in a place where there's much less forest. They don't have anything to compare it to. That's the amount of forest they know or that's the, that's the environment that they know. And so they have no way of detecting that change and that their, their baseline of what is a normal amount of forest has changed. And so I think to, to get past that idea of shifting baselines, it's important. This is one thing that environmental education can do, right, is to raise that awareness. And so, oh, OK, thank you. Vina raised your hand. Great. Thank you. Um, raise that awareness so to, to make it more clear and, and use tools to, to demonstrate what has changed, to show that when it's not it's not intuitive, we can't see it or feel it necessarily without aids, without images, without stories. So stories are a really important way to do that, right? Um, and that's something that environmental education can do. And that's, that's, a, that's awareness, right? That's awareness of a change that we need help to detect it because we're not gonna see it or detect it without that help. Vina, I would love your question. Uh, yeah, so and one of the things that came up uh, as part of the discussion in our breakout uh, room was, also to keep in mind as environmental educators or as nature educators to also think about our own lived experiences and what mm -hmm. we bring to the table before we, you know, uh, set out to intervene or to, uh, you know, to even plan a conservation education intervention. Um, and so to constantly remind ourselves that, and this, this again, uh, very nicely uh, connects to what you just talked about with, with the shifting baseline syndrome, right? Um, so we may come in with an expectation that this is what we expect uh, when we deliver a program or when we design a program, but the kind of lived experiences that our audience has or the stakeholder group that we are going to be working with has will be very different. And so mm. we need to constantly be cognizant of that and to remind ourselves of that and to be sensitive about to that fact as well. Yeah, it just I love just that. Ended. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, there was a lot in what you just said, a lot of really important things. So two really important things are this idea of our own position and understanding the assumptions, our background, and how that's going to impact how we approach this environmental education exchange <laughs> and, and, and how we approach this process. The second thing I really appreciate that you brought up, and I, and I wish actually it's so important that I wish I had some slides on it, is this idea of understanding where people are coming from. So sort of the like knowing where they are, that is a really huge point. And you'll all probably talk about, about this, but in, so just to say here too, that that idea in education, that's one of the biggest new ideas in pedagogy is that one of the most important things you can do as a teacher is you have to know where your students are. So you have to know what they're starting with and build on the understandings that they already have. So the name for this is constructivist learning, if you want to, to have a term, right? This idea 
I like that term because constructivist implies you're, you're constructing something based on what people already know. So you're starting with here's what my students already know. Here is the way they think about this issue right now. Because the idea of, the idea of constructivist learning is that people have tons of ideas about the world. If your students are coming in, they have ways of understanding what's going on. And if you're gonna, if you're gonna talk with them and work to, to bring in new forms of understanding, you have to start with knowing what, what they're doing. What, where you're, you have to know where you're starting and know what's currently in their understanding in order to build on that and maybe address things that need to be changed or, or build on, enrich, learn from what, they, what they're bringing into the picture. So I really appreciate that point of sort of taking a step back and it's related to this, this idea of process, um, coming back to the idea of process and facilitating that you're not just delivering information but you're starting a conversation and you're saying, okay, I, I have these things that we're going to learn, but I also want to hear from you. And I'm also going to ask questions and make sure I understand where you're coming from. I don't know, do you have any other comments, any follow-ups on that, Vina? Anything else to add? Maybe just one quick example in terms of that. Uh, yeah. So when Roshni and I work with a group of teachers, uh, it was inquiry-based learning is a very important element as part of our training uh, with, you know, with, with teachers. And we often went with the assumption that this is something that, you know, is would be easy to do. Um, without, and it took us a while to realize that we had to, in fact, take a step back and handhold them on what inquiry-based learning uh, was, yeah. um, right? And so, but again, that came to us a little later. Uh -huh. um, now, of course, we have a little bit of experience. So we go in with, uh, you know, thinking that, we have to start from scratch, uh, you know, to actually even start from the basics. Um, and so that's why this, um, the, the connection of, you know, actually trying to get as much information of who you're trying to target becomes important. Um, and sometimes it's a learning process for the educator as well. And so to be able to um, quickly, you know, uh, be able to modify your interventions as well uh, through uh, your training. Absolutely, yeah. right. Thank you. Great example. And that's that idea of being responsive. So you have to, you, you have to figure out where your, your students are. And in that case that you maybe be thought they would have known this concept, but it was, you needed to start at an earlier point <laughs> um, talking about inquiry based education. Awesome. Great. Well, I wanted to, to talk now a little bit about the ability to make a difference. I'm going to stop sharing my screen actually, because I think that it's better to, this is not giving us tons of information at this point. Um, so ability to make a difference is the other thing that came up here in terms of difficult to teach. And I just wanna to speak to that a little bit and, and please do chime in others if you have thoughts on this. Another really big point in environmental education and in environmental psychology, which is related to environmental education. So one concept here that's big in environmental psychology is called self-efficacy and that idea of feeling like you can do something. That's what self-efficacy is. The feeling that I can be efficacious, that I, as, a, as, a, as an individual, can make a difference. And so it, it, there's a lot of discussion about how to achieve this in the environmental realm. I think one of the comments here on the, on the Jamboard is students might think, oh, I'm only a kid. What am I going to do? Right. So that's one aspect of this is their, their youth maybe is part of what makes it hard to feel that they can make a difference. But there's another piece of this, which is that this is a, a challenge. I mean, I think it's it, you've identified with this change over time challenge and then the self-efficacy. Same idea is that environmental problems are so big and they're so collective that it's really easy for people to say, well, what difference is it going to make what I do? Because this is such a big problem. Like if I make this small change in my lifestyle, why does that matter? Right. That's not it's a drop in the bucket. It's not going to make a big difference. So this is a really big, really big challenge. So I appreciate that you identified it. And one of the big things I teach about here in, in all of my classes, I think this idea of collective action, and, and this is part of what inspiring this understanding, this really, there's a knowledge related to the fact that everyone needs to work together. That's this, this idea of collective action. But then there's a there's sort of an emotional <laughs> emotional aspect of collective action, which is a commitment to doing something that you recognize isn't going to work unless a lot of people do it, and unless a lot of people get on board. So I think that's something that environmental education can really speak to and work with is this idea of 
working together towards a common goal. And that's one way of dealing with the self-efficacy is that this is something that individuals committing to something, individuals making changes, when it, that's aggregated, that's going to make a difference. So that's one way you can talk about it is that this idea of, of working collectively, being part of a, a team, a larger unit of people who are working on these things. The other argument you could make there is, is this idea that, that in, so there's, there's sort of two sides of this. One is to, to de-emphasize the individual and say, well, the point isn't individuals. The point is working together and creating a, a shared understanding of what we need to do as a society. The other way of approaching this is that, well, the truth is individuals sometimes do matter and the individuals can make can make changes this idea of sharing you know they can they can work with their families if they can change the way their families are acting well that's they're impacting you know a few other people they're impacting you know three four five ten other people to to, to make a change maybe they work to, to to change something in their community they work at a small scale to change something at you know at a at a at a, at a reasonably um reasonable and yet impactful scale. So I think this idea that, yeah, you, you can make a difference. And, and that, again, if many people make those small differences in many places, this would, this would make a big difference overall. And so that piece of ability to make a difference relates really closely to that final point in the Tbilisi Declaration about action, that that is the ultimate goal. And so in environmental education, if you can help give students some small bit of action where they, they can feel that success, right? So they can see, oh, I did this thing and it did make a difference. And even if it was not gigantic, it was something. And me applying myself and taking action did make a difference. And, and um, I think that's one way of choosing small actions that, that give people a sense of success. And Ranjini, I would love to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Rochelle. One of the things I found really interesting last year was uh, people were sharing this uh, meme about Greta and how she started out with just yeah. one person with holding the placard. And mm -hmm. then one year later, the kind of movements that she had spawned across the world and also like starting out little, little, like little leaders basically across the world in environment, like found that actually really inspiring. And for me, that hit home quite hard, like how individuals can make a difference. Of course, it also depends on the ecosystem because, you know, she was there, the Swedish government took notice and, but I think it's still a good example about an individual being able to make a difference. So such a good example. And I, I was going to say, especially with youth, especially when you're dealing with youth, is that she's a good example of, of, a, of a young person who just dedicated herself to something and stood there with a sign, right? And it's, that's a pretty simple action. So I think telling that story is a really good, and like you said, there are some other things going on. There were people who supported her, who, who raised her up and, and helped bring her into the, the, the limelight or into the media, but she still did it, right? And she still took that stand and, and is, 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 remains a, a passionate advocate. So I think finding examples like that, and maybe there are examples other examples in in your contexts that are that are you know re relatable in that way of individuals who have who have stood up for something and who have made a difference yeah um okay just reading yeah so Flavia your point the aspect of dealing with your own family will it make a difference if I make sacrifices yeah so the sacrifices thing is really important in environmental behavior this is it's it's, it's we're often having to do something that has a cost to us but is benefiting the larger good. This idea of pro-social behavior is one name for that, that that I like, that it's these actions that have a social benefit, but, but can, are, are, are sacrifice or are cost or a sacrifice for us. And so I think that is one of the big challenges we address in environmental issues. And so I, I think these, my responses there are emphasizing the collective, emphasizing this need to work together combined with Yes, you, you can make a difference and these things can make a difference and people observing what you're doing so it's you can sort of be an activist like Greta, right, you can you can really stand up for something, but just the everyday actions of changing what you do and showing that it's possible to, to, to make differences also can impact other people, um, because they see that and they they. Uh, are inspired by it and know that it's possible, and then I see the question about the slides i'm absolutely happy to share the slides so. Yes, I'll, if Takara will definitely share them.
Okay, and then Justine, great saying. We need to remind the next generation that they are not the next generation. They are the present and do differences now too. Not sure what that last piece means. Is that what you meant to write, Justine? They are the they are the present. So, so I mean that they often they say you know okay the next generation are going to make changes when they become adults right so that's why we're engaging yeah. them now but it's no they can go out and do something now as, now as young people yeah. they're not next they're the now. <laughs> they're now <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah awesome awesome so this is this is the now generation not the next generation you're the generation now yeah awesome okay well I will move on to what's missing. So I don't, I, I'll, maybe I'll quickly share my screen just so you can see the what's missing because I think it's a really interesting conversation about what else do we need to be talking about when we're doing environmental education. So hopefully you can see this, let me know if not. But okay, so one thing in the group that I was in, um, communication, so right here, we had communication as a theme and this idea over here of hearing from everybody balancing listening and speaking. Um, so he hearing from different voices. And then this idea of listening, um, listen with an open mind, deep listening, really being open to hearing. So one thing I really like about that, it, it, it matches up with what Vina was saying, right? About the importance of not just going in and delivering something regardless of what people are thinking and what people know, but really listening to where people are and, and what's on people's minds and what, what they understand, et cetera. So that's a really important, I love that. I think listening is crucial and is something that I focus on. So for instance, in my environmental education classes, we do a service learning project. And in, in many cases, what we do is we, we listen to the community. So we go and we ask the community questions about an environmental issue. For instance, um, some pollution that's in a nearby lake, we ask them how they think about it, how they learn about it. And we then we present that information, share, share that information with various people, but that we start with listening to what people know rather than spewing out information. So I really like that point. That was Flavia's point that she brought up. Um, and then this idea of discourse also related to communication. So that another point that's important is thinking about what you say and how you say it. So, so being careful, choosing your words carefully. Um, we have the roots here, so that I think that we already discussed that a little bit, that, that it is a little strange, I agree, in an image that is based in ecology and based in sort of understanding an ecological system, that we're missing this gigantic part of the image, the roots. And so I guess I'd love to hear from that group what you said the, the roots were. So maybe let me, I'm going to look at the rest of these, but maybe I'll come back to you and if someone could just verbalize a little bit more about what the roots were. Um, and then this place, place not only as nature, but also as culture, values, worldviews, and how people relate to the place. Absolutely. So that's true. It is not here. So it was something that I discussed um, as a central part of EE, but it is not, it's not here. So I don't know, maybe, maybe that's partly related to roots. I can see place being potentially related to the roots, but I, I, that's a really important point and obviously is important to environmental education. And then the last one, this partnerships so that came up in two groups, I think, the importance of collaboration and, and working together. So I think that's an excellent point that that is not here. There's interdependence, but that's the idea of all living things being interdependent. So that idea of within a social system that you need to be working with others is not there. And I think with environmental education, super important, especially if you think about this idea of action, taking action and, and, and helping students feel efficacious, having partnerships and working with partners can be a really, really effective way to do that. So allowing your students to link up with projects that are going on in the community. So for example, this, what I was just describing about the listening, that was a partnership with the Vermont Department of Health. So our state's Department of Health, because this pollution has health impacts if you are exposed to it. And so part of what they wanted to know is is what do people understand about this? So how, how do we deal with this problem? How do we talk to people about it? And so we had that partnership and it helped the students in my class know that the information they were collecting was going to this partner and the partner was gonna use it in some way. Okay, um, I am looking now at the chat. 
Environment is choosing missing. Okay, yeah. So the environment, yeah, interesting. That's a point. Maybe that's also part of the roots. Um, and then involvement of stakeholders. Okay, yeah. So maybe that's partly related to partnership. This um, Rutuja, Rutuja's point about involvement of stakeholders may be related to partnerships. Um, so I would love to hear if the group that talked about roots, would you be willing to, um, yeah, the, the roots group, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about what you, what was in the roots, what, what, what comprised the roots of the flower. Is anyone willing to share that either in the chat or sh describing it? Uh, yeah, hi, uh, this is Iftikar Ali. So awesome. uh, obviously we were all in this together uh, and uh, concluded that uh, the root is missing, <laughs> but uh, we were trying to figure out what should be the, there uh, in the root. So um, uh, we had some discussion and, uh, uh, and we went after a, a famous saying by Aristotle that the, root of the roots of education are bitter and the fruit is sweet. So obviously the fruit is sweet. Uh, so uh, initially we thought that we should go for a, like a strict or a bitter approach, uh, like uh, to, 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 to involve dedication, passion and all that in the roots. But slowly after some conversation, uh, we realized that um, uh, the people to target are missing, uh, the people, uh, the kind of learners, uh, are missing and that uh, the, edu the educator approach, the approach of the educator is also missing there. And uh, the, if, if we are doing some specific space uh, education, then the, the place of uh, the, the consideration for the place, it, as you have all, uh, also mentioned it in your presentations, the place is also missing. Like if you want to go for a specific place, um, uh, especially a, a large biosphere or something like that. So we can uh, we can take those in consideration. So yeah, these were the main three points to go for the pe the people who we are targeting and uh, the educators approach and the place. Uh, yeah, the, if uh, Vina wants to add something on that, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Iftikar. Yeah. So we went a little bit back and forth in, uh, in, in terms of the conversation. Um, but one more thing we kind of briefly discussed uh, and uh, is the interdependence part of it as well. Um, often we see that, uh, you know, nature seen as this, you know, this very neat little kind of concept uh, and everything is, you know, all lovely and very sweet. Um, and sometimes we, uh, it's, it's good, I think, to, communicate that there's also a lot of messiness in it, just like we have in human society and uh, within our own lives, that things are not so neat in terms of interdependence, that there are so many complications that come along with it. Um, of course, this has to be uh, introduced, uh, you know, age appropriately. It cannot be, of course, you know, it's a bit of a difficult concept to bring in for younger children. But as we have, a, if we have an adult group, uh, it's it's good to talk about the messiness of nature and uh, sometimes the gruesome aspects of nature as well. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one part of it we kind of very briefly discussed. Uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, the interdependence is so to not romanticize in some ways, not romantic. Not it, always romanticize, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's nice, of course, to be you know have the positive side. I think one of the things we uh, talk a little bit about is this. Uh, the, the web of life game, which is usually played, it's, uh, you know, that it's, it's great to understand, yeah. but sometimes it's not so neat that it's not just, just because one thing falls off, that everything else collapses, that there are lots of other things that also come into play, uh, you know, to, to keep systems stable um, as well. Uh, so, but of that, course, it has to be in age appropriate, uh, kind of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but to address the complexity is partly like, be okay. Yeah complexity. And actually, you mentioned um, in that not everything's always perfect and everything that in. I think um, something that, that I teach about um, that's a really big deal for environmental educators, keeping in mind the age appropriate point is you mentioned gruesome, that, they, that, that interdependence can be gruesome. Yeah, it's, it's about death, right? Like death is a really important part of nature. And this is something that, I mean, I think it's culturally different how different cultures deal with death. Yeah. But in American culture, we do not deal with it very directly or openly. And so it's something that can be really traumatic for students when they see you, because you're going to see death in nature, right? You're going to see either a gruesome death, which is like something eating something else, or you'll see animals that are dead. You will, if you're out, you're going to see death. And I think that's one thing of how 
how you address that issue and how, how you, this is part of nature and how, how do you uh, bring that in to the conversation can be one way of doing that. That this is not always so happy, happy. It's that this is part of life, part life, death is part of life. And if we think about cycles, this gets at some of the other issues in that um, diagram. But, but I think that's an example of where it can be helpful to add that richness. Great. Um, and I just want to comment really quickly on the roots point. Thank you so much, Iftikhar. That was that was a great description. I think your three is really clear. Those three points that I like: this idea of educators, learners, and place as like the the sort of specifics that ground everything that's happening. So you have the the people that are participating in the educational exchange, the educators and the learners, and then you have the place that's the setting for all of it. So I. I really like that that idea. So thank you. And then I think Flavia, you added in the in the um, chat that it might be place also is the, the sun and the the rain and the other things that are feeding the flower. So we could go a lot of places with this metaphor and thinking about putting it into context is maybe part of what I'm getting is that it's important to think about the context in which those ideas are being being addressed. And then Justine, you mentioned that maybe we should just open it up. So I think Zena, you were just sharing the interdependence point, one more point that your group talked about. Um, so thank you for that. But is there anything else that came up in the in the breakouts that we haven't yet talked about that didn't get on the Jamboard? Rosh, Roshni. Hi, uh, I also, I was just looking at the diagram again and um, I was just thinking the in the blossom, there are three clear kind of outcomes uh, that we're working towards. So you're looking at environmental integrity, social equity, economic vitality, but what if there's something else or something different? So is there mm -hmm. like another petal in the blossom that hasn't really been, that isn't part of this kind of imagination uh, of what, what yeah. we're striving towards, what the big idea of sustainability is? So yeah. that was one. And, and the other thing, I mean, in the leaves themselves, I was wondering, what are the catalysts for sustainability? So is that is that something, um, mm. I mean, and these catalysts could be, I mean, I guess similar to the roots that they were talking about, that that group was talking mm. about. So is it, it could be people, it could be, um, it could be the place, but what kind of makes you want to do this? What are the values, um, mm. you know, uh, that drive this? So yeah. Yeah, so just, <laughs> yeah interesting, which I think, that's a good point. And I think that this diagram is talking, it's more conceptual, right? It's like, what do you need to understand to understand sustainability and less about environmental education itself? Um, so I think that's a good point that if you're thinking about that idea of motivation, right? So what, what is motivating? So I think that's partly just the nature of this diagram that it's, it's trying to say, here's what sustainability, here's what you need to think about if you're thinking about sustainability specifically. Um, and so I think partly it's like the roots pieces like related to environmental education and how that process works. And I think that that point that you just made is also in that vein is if you're thinking about environmental education then motivation is crucial. And, um, but it's, it's not in here. <laughs> and, but, and I also really, so I think that's partly the nature of the diagram and partly Motivation is part of sustainability. <laughs> you can think about it that way, that we, we need to, if we want to reach sustainability, we have to have some sort of motivation because business as usual is not going to get us there. So that's another way of thinking. Like if something has to change. So we need some sort of cat catalyst. And so that's now that I maybe understand more what you meant. <laughs> I think I, I agree with you. Awesome. And then I think your point about other outcomes is really, really a good point. And, and so it's really important to take a step back and say, what are we aiming for? And I think this is something um, that, that I work on, I know Ranjani works on a lot, is this idea of human well-being and what, what does it mean to be to have well-being? What does that mean to have the good life? And I think that's maybe related to what you're saying is, is what we need, environmental integrity, social equity, and economic vitality, or is there something else there about the, the way that we live and the kinds of lives that we live, values-wise, morality-wise, et cetera? Awesome. Really, yeah, I mean, I think actually what you just said, respect for the environment, the spir spiritual connection with it inspires motivation, but also this, this idea of spirituality, like what do we need to have in terms of what are we aiming for? Is there some sort of sacredness, spiritual, religious component there? For instance, that's not showing up anywhere. Awesome. Well, thank you for, for chiming in so much. Really, really exciting to hear, to hear these ideas, to hear your reactions to this. And yeah, I just really appreciate your, your participation and contributions here.